listening. It's Bill and Tiana with Bill and Tiana's uh, Wine About the Region, where we talk about government and the politics behind it, uh, nonprofit and the people behind it, and business and the money behind it. Let's go. We'd like to thank you for tuning in this evening. Uh, we, you can find us on Facebook, Wine About the Region, Bill and Tiana. It's a live podcast, and our website is btwinery.com. We'll be doing a podcast every two weeks featuring people around St. Louis mm -hmm. and Missouri in politics, nonprofit, and business. So I'll start, uh, I'll start us off with, uh, we had a nice lady sponsor us for wine today. Mm -hmm. Her name is Thomasina Sargent, and she works for a company called Let's see here, because she gave me all this stuff. Wine shop at home. And so it's $39.95 to sign up to be a consultant, or you can book a party with her. But we're going to try our wine. We thank you, Thomasina, for offering us. Thank you, Thomasina. Right. We thank you so <laughs> much. And she says, when you get your wine, she told me to make sure I mention this, that every bottle of wine comes with a recipe. Bill, look at that. Oh, okay. Well, so, if I can cook, it would matter. Yeah. So why don't you <laughs> tell us what the recipe is? For. Looks like this recipe, recipe pairing, is coconut, lime, shrimp, and zoodles. All right. So I don't know what a zoodle is. Okay, but this goes <laughs> with that bottle of wine. So once okay. you get that bottle, that's what you're supposed well, to cook with that. If you cook it, I'll eat it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so he'll eat it, Thomasina, <laughs> and like I said, thank you so much for that. Thank you so much, Thomasina. And we want to open it, or are we going to open it when we get we'll, our we'll guests? We'll wait to our guests, but okay. I think you had something that you wanted to talk about. Yes, okay. I do. I do. Uh, we, in my district, actually I live in the 75th State Representative District, and it has a lot of gun violence in it. And I met a young lady, I ran for state rep in 2018. And I met a young lady and her son that was on a lot selling uh, snacks and food. She had lost her job. This was her only way that she could find to provide for her son. So at that time, they got robbed. And so when they got robbed, I was all upset. I called a lady I know named Becky with Moms Demand Action to see could everybody come out. and. I feel like if you see a lot of people in a community, even when it's bad and they're talking about making a difference and, you know, we don't want gun violence in our area, I think that people that live in the area will like to see something like that, one. Mm -hmm. And two, I just thought it would be a good idea. But uh, today what happened is up in that area, they were telling me a lot about it in 2018 and what the bad things that went on up there and everything. But today, five people. Five people. Yeah, dead in a vacant house. I found, it was like a, I think one of those um, single story apartment it's complexes. It's a single story, yes. And it's, uh, uh, thank God that mm -hmm. she moved her son. They weren't up there because I think this just happened like one o'clock. I, yeah, I mean, started, I don't know. They started these, reporting that, that it happened around noon today. Yeah. Yeah, around noon, one o'clock is when they started reporting. And even on my way down here, they were still like, the street was blocked off. They were investigating it. So, you know, I just want to say that at this point, I've been talking a lot on my Facebook page about gun violence and trying to end it. You know, we, we really need to try to take an active role in it. You know, you can join these groups and say you're against gun violence and all that, but some of it is actually going to the area, mm -hmm. you know what I mean, where the gun violence is happening. and having your shirts on and knocking on doors and uh, even if it's a bad neighborhood, would you agree? I agree. I agree. All right. And uh, that's pretty much all I want. That was kind of on my heart. So I, I appreciate I you letting me talk about well, it. Well, we, we, we whining about the region, so we got to talk about what's going on. <laughs> um, so, so everybody much. be safe out there. But we're going to go ahead and, and get started. Our first guest today, uh, she is the president of her own consulting firm, uh, called New Day Consulting. This is today's first guest. It's Nicole McBee. Woo! Ms. McBee, come on in here. Come on down, girl. Come on down. Maybe now we can pop by. All right, yeah, we, we can pop for a second. Pop <laughs> All right. Are we popping bottles? Hey, girl. Let's pop some bottles, too. Well, right. thank you guys for having me. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank Especially you. On... This is our second show we on our second show now. second show second show <laughs> thank you second show so we'll keep thank it going you. and i'm gonna thank tell you about uh myself and 
Uh, Nicole, I met Nicole actually when I was uh, North County Coordinator working on Charlie Dooley's reelection campaign mm -hmm. in 2010. And our campaign office happened to be right in the same uh, little business complex that an office that she was working in uh, uh, really? what was located uh, called is Deer Valley, right? Mm -hmm. Deer Valley Home, I had a Deer Valley. Home Healthcare. Yes. Okay. In Berkeley, is it? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 okay. Yes, I know you were doing some stuff to help them. Uh, and some of their business challenges. So, so, so yeah, how about you talk? So ultimately, what happened is, is that um, um, I transitioned from banking into small business. Uh, okay. So I was in banking. Um, I was a personal banker for a very long time. I moved to an assistant manager uh, with one of the top three banks in the country. Okay. Um, had a great opportunity um, to get to travel. Uh, and be bank ambassador, so it was amazing. But I, like many women, um, we kind of hit a ceiling. And so I was top 2% in the region. And ultimately what occurred was, it's like, oh, well, we had, you know, minorities were struggling uh, to yeah. actually hit the C-suite. Mm -hmm. And so I, I have my MBA, I have a master's mm -hmm. in management, mm -hmm. and, and yet high performing, uh, excelling and they kind of kept us stuck in middle management and I was like well nope I'm ready to go I have now experience mm -hmm. proven numbers proven record um, the clientele and now also the education as well okay. and I just got stuck so I had an opportunity to break off into entrepreneurship like many many women especially in the St. Louis region mm -hmm. as we know the Riverfront Times just ultimately said hey women minority minor especially minority women are exiting the market and becoming entrepreneurs. They're leaving right. corporate jobs. Right. And I, I think that we've participated in diversity and inclusion programs. We've done everything that you've asked us to do in corporate segments. Right. right. And, and the corporate and you still, step, and uh, still get stalled. And you still get process. stalled in the process. Yeah. Uh, but I think, um, and for me, it, it wasn't some of the trouble spots that other people have, like lack of mentorship, mm -hmm. things of that nature. I didn't have that. I had the mentors, I had the education, um, but ultimately it was a great thing because I actually had got an opportunity um, to see the business in action. Mm. Uh, I had worked on many business plans for funding. I, I educated a number of businesses on how to build business credit, how to align themselves um, to become bankable. I've done financial literacy. So I've always kind of done the, the theory of it, and this was an opportunity to actually apply it. Can I ask you what kind of organizations you've worked with? So I've worked with Fortune 500 companies, mm -hmm. all the way down to mom and pops. Really? Yes, companies with you know two employees, with companies with 600 employees. So that shows you don't discriminate. <laughs> I do not discriminate. I love minority-owned businesses. I love women-owned businesses, and my niche is truly women-owned businesses. Yeah. Um, so just across the sector, because I feel one. Women on businesses since 1970, since I was born, 77, has grown 103%. Mm -hmm. wow. We now have 11.6 women owned businesses. We generate $1.7 million in, in trillion, let me say that again, with a T, trillion dollars wow. in sales. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm gonna thank Bill real quick because this is great because have you told her about like the Women's Political Caucus and what I do, I, I, which we I, have I, our I convention have this I, month. <laughs> we have our convention coming up for the National Women's Political this Caucus. This is her plug time. It's the St. Louis this year. And so, you know what, and this is on and on again, I always say business and politics are brother and sister. Yeah. Yes, but this is great because she needs to start being okay. Especially that's, that's, with the minority, if you know, that gets the ball. Okay. okay. Talk to the people. Yeah. <laughs> I just got a little moment real that's so I was that's excited. Okay. It's Go okay. ahead. Hey, Sorry. You know Plug it. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, 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 me, let me ask you this. Okay. You, you mentioned that you, you work with companies that, you know, from two employees up to maybe 100, 600 or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, I assume some of those uh, large companies with a lot of employees have, you know, a lot of revenue. T I, give me an idea of. You want to talk money? I want to oh, talk money. Wanna, <laughs> I want to talk money. You and wanna and wanna and talk I want to talk dollars. What's your biggest success story, or maybe a couple of really big success stories okay, from so work that you did actually was directly impactful in, in developing and growing a business? So okay, so consulting, we solve problems. Um, sometimes we solve problems that companies have called us to say, hey, th this is our problem. We also pop in and we discover other problems. 
Um, but my, I've worked with, again, revenues of $100,000 annual up to $155 million. Mm -hmm. So my biggest success story, the company that I, you and I met, they started at, I think, $55,000 annual. Mm -hmm. In eight years, we were selling, soaring well above $27 million I, I, for a minority-owned business, um, which is quite unheard of. That's why I'm like. As a, well, I remember, and, I remember when, when Deer Valley really started getting ramp, uh, ramped up, and I knew that you were working with them, and then I look around one day, and I see 20 different buses wrapped <laughs> with well, Deer and, and that's strategic marketing. Yeah. It, it's truly saying, hey, let me put some of the things that I've learned in corporate America in place for a, a minority-owned business. Mm. And I think that's where minority-owned businesses struggle, because uh, when I walked in the door there, I, I first thing I asked was, you know, who do we call for help? And they said me. Uh, or it was like, I'm like, where's the SOP? And they're like, standard operating procedure. Yeah, yeah. And they're like, <laughs> uh, you create it. I was like, okay, where's the employee I've handbook? And they're like, I'm you develop it. Legal, and mm -hmm. I work for lawyers, and I've had that happen when you go in the office and you like, okay, where's the memo? Because it's kind of like you just change the name and add nothing, but it's like some of the, the documents you have to develop them mm -hmm. from scratch. I've done that. Um, I've done that. I've implemented another huge success is just implementing systems. I'm not an IT person, and IT is not Me one neither. of the businesses that I follow. However, I am now growing um, in the tech space and learning and developing myself in that space. Um, but I've implemented systems. Um, I, I think I started speaking a whole other language when I started talking tech. I was like, look, I don't need to learn uh, Spanish just yet. I, mm -hmm. I just need to learn tech. <laughs> <laughs> you learn so, tech in English. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. So where are the organizations that you've worked with located? So I have about 300 in the St. Louis market. Mm -hmm. St. Louis, well, in the Missouri market, because I want to include Kansas City and Springfield. Also about 12 in Michigan, mm -hmm. another 30 in North Carolina. Uh, one in Thailand, so I also have an international presence, yeah. and then also you know I, you're taking me when you go to my to son just visited <laughs> there, and he yeah he likes it. So. Sure. And I'm also working currently on a deal uh, with a company in Nigeria. Wow. Yeah. No, she's for real. You go, girl. <laughs> you hey, go. I, I would definitely try. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, all right. Let's focus a little bit uh, in these last uh, couple minutes on. Uh, underserved local communities uh, like uh, North County and, and North City. What are the greatest needs for the organizations? And, and I assume that you, you not only uh, work with for-profit businesses, but for nonprofits and, and maybe even for local government. I don't, I don't know. Absolutely. Um, what kinds of things um, need to happen either through government or some other mechanism that helps these, these organizations be more successful? Consistently, I'm finding that we're not able to break in to get contracts. So one of my biggest goals is developing requests for proposals, writing the proposals, obtaining grant funding, um, and I find that underserved businesses just don't get it. Um, so I work with uh, quite a few construction businesses, and sometimes it's you know lack of preparation, mm -hmm. but also it's but a, a lot of them they're just not even seeing them. Mm -hmm. um, so th I think that's one, two, financial education. Um, we just, we're not teaching financial literacy in schools. Um, even in my MBA um, at Webster, which I'm very proud of, there, there were some avenues that was not taught when I moved into the business world. Mm -hmm. So when I moved away from banking into actually having to apply it, some of these th concepts were completely new and I had to go Google it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Seriously, it's like, yeah, I mean, well, I need to educate myself on this. Google's so handy, though. I love Google. Girl, <laughs> don't get me started about <laughs> Google. I always joke and say, well, that's worth a Google. <laughs> Ooh. Well, let me ask you, what can organizations like the NAACP do to improve outcomes for minority businesses? Mentorship, uh, seminars. Uh, I, I find businesses that are prepared to um, move from leasing to purchasing commercial commercial buildings, and they want to come back that's to the neighborhood, yeah, but th they're still thing. they're getting they're getting roadblocks. Okay. Uh, they're getting roadblocks by financial institutions. So just levering the relationships with banks, levering relationship, levering the relationship also with city government. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of underserved and minority-owned businesses and women-owned businesses, are, they give up after just getting just fighting through permits. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I, I've met two restaurateurs in. They, they said, hey, you know what, we've been roadblocked with one permit for nine months. Mm -hmm. We've now spent well over $200,000 invested in this business and we give up. Good Lord. Okay. 
because they, they were <laughs> unable to get their permit. And they were understanding. Uh, they were unable to just communicate effectively with local municipalities. And I think NAACP is one organization that could kind of, you know, say, let me arbitrate this. Let me let me be the mediator in this. Let me put up the fight. Yeah, fight let me put let, let me fight the fight for you. Yeah. Maybe you guys are not speaking the same language. Um, maybe you're not understanding the document requirements. And not all businesses can afford consultants. So there, there's some businesses that come to me and they, they can't afford it. Um, but of course, you know, I will give some services. Um, but there's other things that I feel like nonprofit organizations should assist them with. All right, well, what else would you like to share with our viewers? And, and of course, you know, let them know your website. We want to make sure they know how to find you. But sure. You know, so what, you what else would you like to share with them before I, we close out here? Nicole McBee on all of my social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Snapchat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> my website is uh, newdayconsult.com, www.newdayconsult.com. Um, my thing that I do want to share is it is the year of the entrepreneur. And as I say, hey, you know what? We, we're, we need to turn these side hustles into serious hustles. Mm -hmm. And create People businesses. Create, and create jobs. jobs. Create, create, you're group. creating yeah. jobs. I, I create jobs for offenders, um, giving second chances. Take a look at your business model. Decide if you need assistance. Reach out to organizations like the NAACP. Reach out to some of the other nonprofit organizations. Connect with your local government. Uh, so a lot of times it's just relational. You have, we have no relationship with the with individuals that can actually help us propel our businesses and our careers. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, do great work. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to thank you for coming. One, 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 one of the things that, that, that someone and I forget, I forget whether someone told me this or whether I got this from a movie. No, actually, I think my very good friend, very dear friend, told me this. People will pay top dollar for excellence. So you know what I was, uh, Bishop T.D. Jakes is. If, if I can solve a problem, I can make some money, mm -hmm. and Absolutely. I come to solve problems. Absolutely. Okay. I like that. I like that. Yeah. Well, I'm so glad you came. Thank you. Thank you. We thank are you. so glad you gave us, you know, your time and whatever we can do mm -hmm. to help you. Thank you. I know you guys are already working together, but now I know yeah, you we, we, we go you'll go be go. joining the Women's Political Caucus. Well, she gonna try to she gonna try to get you roped into that. <laughs> um, uh, uh, but Nicole, if you can hang around just for a little bit, we would, yeah, we would like yeah, you yeah. to, to yeah. hang um, yeah, yeah, yeah. as we bring in our next guest. Yes. Uh, and now we want to welcome President of the City of St. Louis uh, 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 NAACP. Mr. Hey. Adolphus Pruitt. I feel like we should like do some grand like uh, <laughs> da 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 da. <laughs> yes, we like. <laughs> yes, we like. <laughs> I feel like something huge should relax, be done relax, for you, Adolphus, because you the man. To me, okay. I'm just letting you know. That's okay. how I feel. You've All been right. everywhere. Yeah, he's, he's been around, uh, uh, and, and, and he's been on the front lines of, of a lot of uh, uh, difficult issues for this community. So I, I do he want to tip scared. my hat, tip my hat to you. you. You go right mm -hmm. up in there and scare mm -hmm. the, the mess out of him. I almost got my <laughs> own question, like, how early did you start? Just like, did you come out the womb just fighting? No. <laughs> I just need no, to know. No. I mean, no, sorry. I've been, no, I've been self-employed since I was 22 years old. So well over 40 years. Okay. And I've only That's been with cool. been with NACP for about uh, 11, been president for about nine. And uh, it's been interesting. Just an opportunity to take uh, relationships and what I've done as a uh, business person over the years and apply it to uh, this issue of advocacy and uh, what we would call a level in the playing field. And I think we do a very good job at it. I think so too. Yeah. All right, well, tell us, uh, you know, about the, the, the city of the NAACP. Um, and there's a question I've been been wanting to sort of get clarification on, just to understand for myself. Sure. Which is why uh, the St. Louis region has, you know, basically two, you know, two NAACP chapters. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I ask is because you know, definitely in the last couple of years, it seems like, you know, the county chapter and the city chapter have been at odds or on separate sides of certain issues. And, and case in point, it's, it's like the uh, the city county merger issue. So tell us a little about the history, you yeah. know, how, how they came yeah. about and, you know, just. So we are, yeah, there's a couple of things we need to understand is that 
The city branch was established two years after the national NACP established. So we, we're as old as the NACP in itself. Wow. And if you go back and look at the history as relates to most of the significant uh, achievements and the civil rights that came up out of St. Louis and in most cases impacted the issue on a national basis, they came out of the uh, city of St. Louis branch. Uh, we can go back to uh, the Law Gaines case. We we actually uh, we represented Law Gaines. It it opened up African Americans in both uh, University of Columbia, University of Missouri Law School, uh, uh, and from there the basis of that case is what Thurgood, the Max and Thurgood Marshall was with the NACP, and they came down with us. And it was the basis of that case in which Thurgood and them argued for Brown versus the Board of Education. Uh, when it comes to restricted covenants, you know, the Shelley's house of on Lavity, mm -hmm. it ended restricted covenants across the country. Mm -hmm. uh, again, uh, we represented them in that in that particular case, and so again, took it to the Supreme Court. As a matter of fact, you know, out of St. Louis, there's about maybe six cases that went to the Supreme Court that actually established civil rights precedents that are still in effect today. Mm -hmm. The one we can't take credit for is, of course, uh, uh, Green versus McDonnell Douglas, mm -hmm. which is the hallmark for dealing with uh, 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 bias and, and uh, employment discrimination. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that's the, you know, it's the hallmark. But most of the things, the uh, 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 St. Louis Public Schools, the desegregation case, you know, that's something we fought and, and got the settlement agreement on. Mm -hmm. So if you go back and you look at the history of civil, that's why when the History Museum did that, uh, that exhibit first in civil rights, what they were basically saying was that most of the significant civil rights gains this country has came out of efforts or civil rights victories in the St. Louis right, area. St. Louis they had national implications. Uh, if you go back and look at the exhibit all through it, you'll see uh, an NACP because at most of the time we, uh, uh, we took the lead or uh, from a legal counsel standpoint, we fought in the courts. I was watching, what was it, it was at Fairgrounds Park where they had the big racial the uh, swimming pool. The swimming pool thing. Yeah, yeah, I, I remember swimming, watching yeah. something about that like two years ago. And I was like, yeah. wow. That had been, and, and a whole lot of stuff sprung out of that. Well, a good example is the riots in East St. Louis. When the riots occurred in East St. Louis and it was burning down the black folks' houses and killing them, as they came across the East Bridge, it was NACP who, who mm. brought them over here and got them established mm. uh, with, with some safe, some safe, some some place safe to go. And, of course, out of there came their relief. Mm. Uh, mm. So, you know, we, we can... We can uh, 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 gladly uh, uh, take pride in a lot of the stuff we participated in and made happen, and and so we've stayed on that pinnacle. So we, we you know, we tell people all the time we are a traditional uh, civil rights uh, agency, a chapter versus uh, some some branches that do a little bit different. Mm -hmm. And there's more than one NACP branch in Chicago and other yeah. areas. Yeah. So I mean, in in essence, what happened is uh, uh, African Americans moved and migrated to uh, North County or, or, or let's just say west of Skinker, uh, west of Skinker, yeah. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and uh, began to gain some uh, uh, political foothold and, and take over some communities. They felt that they needed a uh, branch in ACP that would be more responsive uh, to uh, uh, their needs out there in the county. Mm -hmm. So they established one, they, and, you know, things happen. Branches have uh, what we call, what I like to term is they have their artistic freedom. Yeah. On a national level, we mm -hmm. set policy and direction on issues that we think communities need to be dealing with. But how you tackle that issue in your community, you sort of have artistic freedom because um, desegregation of schools in St. Louis can be totally different from desegregation of schools mm -hmm. in yeah. your city, well, I Kansas yeah. City, I, I can understand LA, that. But, but, and Chicago. So, so the same approach doesn't work. <laughs> what are your I, thoughts? I get, I get what are that, you but, but I, I, mean, I guess what I'm, what I'm thinking is that. You know, on the on a macro level, especially, and I think just the, the city county merger is a perfect example. On a macro level, you know, it would it would just be, it would be nice to have you know an organization with the reputation uh, that the NAACP has on uh, issues in the black community. It would nice it would be nice to have you guys on the same page. Yeah, let's just, <laughs> hopefully, on the page that I agree with. Well, let's let's let's, <laughs> let's just say this is that uh, from our perspective, we are a um, we, we operate and deal with issues regionally or statewide, and we deal with everything that comes through our door. Mm -hmm. And so as it relates to the region and what happens in the region, 
Uh, most cases, uh, our fingerprint is on it, and it happens in a good way. So whether we are operating on the same page or not, we're still getting the job done, and I think that's all that counts. <laughs> Sometimes that's we have it. So okay. should I? Go ahead. Okay. So let me ask you, what top three regional issues that the city and the LACP is focused on? Well, actually, uh, so let's let's be clear. The 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 most pressing uh, uh, issue for the region is uh, uh, the issue of underserved populations and them being a part of. Uh, um, the, the the region's economy. So we I, I, so uh, economic based theory holds that uh, communities, in order to prosper, must have income. Mm -hmm. Income, which is primarily derived yeah. from the wages the that the people in that community earns. And so when that does not happen, those communities suffer adverse catastrophic outcomes: poor health outcomes, mm -hmm. poor educational outcomes, high crime. Uh, all of these things that impact. Uh, 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 underserved populations are a byproduct of poverty, but and so why you got a lot of people? Well, so you got a lot of people. Why well, you got a lot of people and a lot of organizations attacking those individual issues? But from our perspective, uh, the, the 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 issue that the one problem that we can solve solve all those issues is the increase of household income. So we are always always focusing on um, uh, opportunities to grow. Uh, income and households, and we do a very good job at it. Not only locally, but statewide. We give you example. Uh, well, seven years ago, the uh, Minority Business in Initiative that's under under the Missouri Housing Development Commission, which opened up the door statewide and got more minority participation in hundred million dollar or greater tax program, low income housing tax program. Actually, I wrote it. We wrote it. Mm -hmm. We got it approved, and it's been in impact in, in fact uh, the whole time. The Missouri uh, Finance Development Board. Same thing. Uh, we got that done. It's, it's impacting everybody statewide, but especially the urban areas, St. Louis and Kansas City. The uh, the only and the largest uh, a community benefits agreement in the re the only one in the region, and maybe the third largest in the country, is the four point four point five billion dollar MSD mm -hmm. uh, uh, community development. Yeah. Uh, we that that Consent community decree. benefit. We wrote it. Yeah. We wrote it, we got it passed, and African Americans are participating. We well over 200 million has gone in African American businesses. Mm -hmm. The uh, wow. the SLU uh, 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 community benefit agreement for the SLU, that 200 acre that they're going to redevelop in SLU Hospital, okay. uh, we we signed that one last year. We wrote it along with our partners, and it's an impact. Mm -hmm. The uh, disparity studies for the city, MSD, the city, the county, St. Louis Community College. All those disparity studies, we the ones yeah. that, that came up, put, put it up to the table. Yeah, and I've been watching and got years. them done. Even, even on the yeah, front and, line, I used to sit up at the MSD yeah, meetings yeah, yeah, uh, every yeah, month and, and, and watch you go yeah. at it. And then St. Louis <laughs> County, only first time having uh, legislatively For established minority a minority program. participation yeah. program. Yeah. Yeah. That bill, we worked with Hazel Irving yeah, all after the bill, mm -hmm. and we got it done. Good. But so those are good. so those are just the global th those the global things, but at the same time, you know, we get 50, 100 calls a week for mm -hmm. individual advocacy, and it goes from everything from somebody being mistreated in their apartment by by their landlord, who may be white, may be black, to somebody being mistreated on the job, to uh, somebody dealing with the police. I mean, we get hundreds of calls, and, we, and so our individual advocacy is just as strong as the other side. Okay, so you, you do a lot of advocacy work on a macro level and on an individual if, micro level. If it comes through the door or come over the phone <laughs> or come by email, we're going to deal with it. Well, you, you got, well, you got I, a business owner here. Well, actually, I think I've uh, inboxed him Have you really? on a, a, one occasion, uh -oh. probably about did two years ago. Did you ask her back when he she did. inboxed him? And I, I think I was asking him a question. He answered it was on a Saturday. Uh -huh. And I was like, hey, what's going on with this and how are we taking action? Uh -huh. uh, I will do everything as an individual citizen, but what else can, as an organization, what can NAACP do to assist this party? Okay. Um, and I don't even remember what it was, but I remember inboxing it and he responded and said, we're on top of it, we're, we got our hands on it right now. Okay. Well, we, and we return our calls. If you go to our website and put hit the re report to the community and just look at it, and I think you'd be surprised. Cortex, the, the diversity that's happening in Cortex and all of that, we was at the table, we, we wrote it, we've we done it. 
Well, I got, she, just got a shout out to Adolphus yeah. for answering his inbox. Exactly. People don't answer <laughs> their the inboxes, inboxes. <laughs> and this man do. So now y'all know. But we get some crazy it. stuff we don't answer. <laughs> <laughs> Believe I'm me. I'm just happy I'm to hear her say that, all the reasonable though. Requests. Believe me. I'm so happy to hear her. <laughs> but I'm just, all I'm saying is that it's a, it's a big job. It takes a lot of folk. And, and so we focus on changing policy and putting uh, – legislation and other stuff into place across the board mm -hmm. with the hopes that uh, uh, more African-American participation would result in uh, more dollars going into African-American households. And so we got to get the, the issue done with the households, but, but we have to understand, I just ran off all of that stuff and we can point right. to hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars going to minority businesses and otherwise. Mm -hmm. but. It's like pissing in the ocean trying to cause a flood. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm just, I'm just saying. Really, in the office, come well, on now. I mean, have you ever pissed in the ocean? I just, I just want to. But have you ever pissed in the ocean? Okay, well, never mind. I'm saying the fifth. I'm saying the fifth. But what? No, the, the, but the point I'm trying to get at is that it is such a problem that it takes sustained injections into those communities, into those households, I get for you to saying. see the impact. I get what and, you're and Yeah, because I'm working with business owners who are saying, hey, those dollars are not trickling down to me. I'm mm -hmm. working with construction companies yeah. who are saying, hey, I'm applying. Um, I yes, I went in. Yes, you know, they've advocated mm -hmm. for us. However, I'm still being roadblocked to get the funding that I need. And I have the projects, or I'm having trouble getting minority certified. Uh, I'm getting the roadblocks. I'm having trouble getting insurance mm -hmm. um, for this list of reasons. So yes, these programs are in place and they're all excellent programs, but again, it's like, you know, a little small drop in a big ocean. Well, but you know, it, 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 it sore swings both ways. So three, three years ago, we kept hearing from African American contractors that access to capital was their biggest issue. Mm -hmm. So we got with our partner, Stiefel Bank, got some other folks together. We created a $10 million uh, construction loan fund. Mm -hmm. It's there, it's been in place. The largest loan was a million dollars to African American female mm -hmm. contractor. And so we got we got plenty of folks that, that taking advantage of it and over the years we put maybe five and then five, six million dollars in three years out on the street. But what happens is we get a lot of companies that apply, they don't they don't have the infrastructure in place to take advantage of it on and on the other side of it, a lot of them want it to be a grant. Mm -hmm. And we're like, no, it's not a grant. The issue yeah. is is that is that we want to make you bankable. And believe me, uh, uh, we've had instances where folks have had got along and had some problems and we were able to do things that a normal bank couldn't do. And see that's where I come in and it's like to create the infrastructure. Yeah. Okay. To say, hey, I, I want to take you to the dollars. Yeah. However, yeah. there's some requirements from your yeah. business that must be met. There's some things there's some systems that need to be in place. There are some filings that need to go into place. These things need to happen before we approach mm -hmm. um, to ask for the funding. Mm -hmm. yeah. But but and, but we've never had opportunity to put all ten million dollars on the street. Not because we're not trying to put it out there. Put it on my street. What out. does it mean? What do people need? Look into this camera. What do people need? It's a good example. It's a good example. Uh, uh, you come in, you want the loan, but you haven't filed your tax returns in the past three years. <laughs> That's a problem. That's <laughs> a problem. Real, <laughs> or, uh -oh. or or you don't or you know you 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 are you're doing a lot of uh, business by cash. Uh -huh. So being able to track the cash flow, being able to get some understanding, putting your books together. Have, there, I mean, there, there's just a lot. And, and it's not that nobody's trying to, we're gonna do that, but you have some, some folks who, they, they reach a, a level where they're comfortable that I got control of this business, mm -hmm. what I got coming in, I know I can make this happen, and I'm, I'm satisfied here. I think that's and trying to get them to grow. Yeah. I, I, so yeah. I think that we're trying to get people to 100 when mm -hmm. they, they need assistance at 10 and 20. Mm -hmm. that's uh, and so again, that's where I come in. And mm -hmm. it's like, hey, you know what? I, we need to build a business structure. Mm -hmm. um, you guys are great at providing the service, mm -hmm. but now when it's time to scale the business, we're missing the mark in scaling it because we haven't had a, a foundation for the business. And so again, mm -hmm. we, we ask organizations like the Urban League, Father Support, NAACP, we're asking Grace Hill to say, hey, can we get some of the basics? Mm -hmm. 
Because uh, again, we're missing the basics. When I think about it real quick, I want to ask you, so you you help businesses, and I'm sorry, no, this just popped in my head, but you know, I know women from the point of they just selling pimples. Haven't you ever saw these they selling these yeah, pimples? And, yeah. and even women like that, they've tried to get them like my hairdresser. She sells pimples too. And it's like she's attempted to get it bigger and get it in the store. But even those kind of businesses you help with also? Like yeah, because the sort of small mom and pop, yes. Because the business development has know. to be there. Because I, I can't walk in here and ask <laughs> Mr. Perler. I can't say, hey, you know what, can we give them a million dollars and we, we don't even have a cash flow, we don't have balance yeah, sheets, yeah. we don't so have financial. you heard that, Pam, and thank you for putting up with me, Pam, and I was doing my heart, <laughs> but when I be leaving, you be selling me some pickles and stuff, and this lady here, she can help take you to the next level. Mm -hmm. All right, back to you, Mr. Adolphus. But strong, and then the other thing for the region, though, is, is uh, uh, the biggest thing oh, yeah, is yeah. airport okay. privatization. Mm -hmm. Right. So let me ask you, Could where be. is the NAACP on medical marijuana? And we'll get to both of them. Oh, so we want to talk about privatization, uh, uh, too. We, we worked and we went around the state and worked with a, a new approach. Uh, we won at the ballot box. Okay. Uh, we are working with any number of putting, putting uh, minorities. And actually, it's, it's ironic. We are creating, we're having more diverse groups that are getting ready, putting applications together, See, that's, that, and go after, and so we've been teaming up. I tell you, <laughs> that, 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 that has been my biggest concern. Like, yeah. like, like they've been, black folks and people of color have been been uh, put in jail for decades for, for this for mm -hmm. this stuff, mm -hmm. and and I want to make sure that that uh, uh, as this gets legalized, that uh, people of color have an opportunity to actually reap the benefits of well, profit. Yeah, and that, that opportunity that and that opportunity to happen. That's right. That opportunity <laughs> will happen more <laughs> when we get to recreational, like the stuff they're doing in Illinois. The Illinois mm -hmm. is the legislation that they prove and sign yeah. is going to do most of it. But on the medical, but let's 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 be clear. I ain't trying to be funny, but some people don't really want to hear about medical. They just want to know. Period. So well, we, well, I'm not, but we have to talk about what's, uh, uh, okay. what's happening. Yeah, that's true. We have to talk about what's going on. We have to talk about what's going on. We don't talk about that. We just say okay. that if okay. you want, if, well, if you want, I know it's people watching in, right now. Yeah, but I'm saying if you want to get an industry in St. Louis or in the state of Missouri, medical is it, and those applications are due in a month. And what it takes, <laughs> and, and what it takes <laughs> to get those, what it takes to get those applications in, and the funding, what it takes. You know, I met a group of uh, African American women who mm -hmm. wanted to go into cultivation, and we basically had to sit down and, and and share with them that hey, to have a good cultivation facility, you know, you're gonna spend a million three to create it and all this other stuff, and and they didn't have that capacity, mm -hmm. but we but we turned around and we teaming them up with 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 some folks who are going at the dispensary, and they're gonna own a big. They're going to part of the bigger picture. This company wants to go nationwide mm -hmm. eventually, mm -hmm. so they're they're in a very good space. They're very happy. So it's a <laughs> it's so it's, like it's no, space. but, but like you have to meet happy. but you have to meet people where they are, you do. and then you have yeah, to you do. then you have to match them or That's put them a in a position space. where they can get in and they can grow with the industry mm -hmm. and take advantage of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because let's just access to capital has always been an issue for African Americans, but it's really an issue when you talk about an industry in which federal banks are not lending into that industry in the first place. So mm -hmm. now it's about strictly, it's about investment capital or your private capital mm -hmm. is what you got to make, what you got to use to do that. But we high on medical marijuana, we high on uh, 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 recreational, we want to make it happen. <laughs> yeah, we want to make it Well, the, I'm just letting you know, the, some people get mad at me not to no, say, all right, medical, but no, hey. Listen, the industry is coming, <laughs> I'm just listen, the industry is coming and, and, and we believe in is that uh, as industries emerge, we need to get African Americans in on, on, on at the, at the ground floor. Right, right, when it's I'm starting right. to happen. And I'm then we right. have to build from there because if you don't, we we'll turn around and look back like we're looking at, because when people talk to me about social media and technology and stuff, I just, I just cringe. Mind, well, I cringe because, uh, you know, African Americans are the probably no one users of uh, mm -hmm. of all of that stuff. Oh, that Twitter, all that stuff. Yeah. And, Everybody but got the folks, but they don't phone. own any of it. And, you know, so. And that's because we didn't get in at the bottom level, and now we're trying to get in now. And so we'll see. But, but I think like in from an Apple point of view, from an Apple user point of view. I'm talking. I'm talking from a industry point of view. Is okay. that that? The, but is that right now? It's changing. It's going to consistently change, and it's moving at light speed. Mm -hmm. 
And and if you had to not only get in, but you had to get in on the front end because Absolutely. it's going to change. It's, it's you know what you're using now. If we get in now on 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 a certain thing now, the way it's changing is going to be obsolete in a minute. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's it's but we got some folks out of some black folks out of Silicon Valley and some other folks that Definitely. are really starting to get a foothold on it. Yeah. So even with the cannabis business, and I have two clients that are in cannabis, uh, unfortunately they're not minorities, um, but I, the minority clients that have contacted me for assistance, they feel like they're behind. They feel that they're two or three years behind, so when I mention criteria and I, I start educating them about it, they're de they feel like they're lost in the dark about the process to actually apply, and then also again the access to capital. Um, they're saying, hey, we're being, we're limited. Mm -hmm. And there is no organization, they're limited to organizations that are venture uh, capital firms that are willing to give out money. Um, so uh, again, here we are with women and minorities yeah. still well, behind. I, I have, like personally, I have issues with stuff like, like this because I mean, to me, they create obviously huge barriers of entry when you know your license costs. What does it cost? Like a hundred thousand, hundred fifty thousand, no. ten thousand dollars, six thousand per application. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it ain't, but all you need is some seeds. Give me some seeds and some grass. Well, well, you, but actually, <laughs> yeah. but, a, but actually, you can grow at home. The law yeah. does provide you to grow at home okay. for your individual use. Okay. You have to get you have to get a license from, by your doctor. You still have to go through the same process, but, but you, you can grow at home. But when you say sixteen thousand dollars. To some individuals, when you're saying, "Hey, the application fee is the six thousand dollars, and then another ten thousand dollars annually mm -hmm. for license," in addition to that, we do not have to go back to municipalities. And this is where we come back to you, Bill. We come back to you saying, "Hey, our municipality is not going to even allow us in because we don't have a political relationship." Mm -hmm. uh, and then also, we, we're wanting someone to bridge that conversation, so we're looking to the NAACP to help bridge that conversation on behalf of the business owner and advocate. And some businesses are missing that. You know, if they think they can't get in, again, that's the education part because of constitutional memory where it's written, the municipality can't keep them out. Only way, the only restriction they got about where they can locate a municipality is within a thousand feet of a church or a school. Mm -hmm. And in the city of St. Louis, we just passed legislation eliminating all of that. Mm -hmm. okay. So, you know, so constitutionally, you know, they can't be restricted. So you can get in. Mm -hmm. the, the, you know, getting in is not necessarily the issue. Is 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 the dollars to stay in? Is it? But but re, but remember this. Remember this. Our entry for, for medical marijuana Missouri application wise, entry is cheaper than anywhere in the country. This is true. It's really? Cheaper. Yeah, we, it, it was done that way. And the number of licenses that they have to allow is higher than anywhere in the country. Because they want to make sure that acts, we want to get cheaper mm -hmm. and make sure there's enough licenses where people can mm -hmm. actually have an opportunity to do it. But the entry amount of money is not much different than you open a liquor store, you're going to spend $1,500,000. You open a restaurant, you're going to spend $1,500,000. So the, 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 the dollar, the entry amount is not the issue. Even if they get in, and this is my big concern about mom and pop because of the big boys are in too. Yeah. And, and, and they all men. And they all the men. Yeah. Like, <laughs> we got white mom and pop and black mom and pop. So the mom and pops know. are going to have a problem from a marketing standpoint and a branding standpoint because just because you open up a dispensary and hang your shape out there does not mean that the person who has a, the ability to buy is going to come buy from you. That's and true. so the marketing and the branding is just as critical as everything yeah. else. And that's across. And, and it has nothing to do with the fact that it's marijuana. That's any business. Yeah. It's across the board. Okay, absolutely. All right, well, let's, before we uh, get too, far, too much further than that, let's go to our next topic. I want, I, want, I want to get your thoughts on uh, airport privatization. Uh, uh, I know like, you have been in the article recently. Support it, support it 100%. It bit, so let's be clear. And I'll be clear, I, I really don't. I'm, I'm, so, so please. I'm, 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 yeah, this let, is let interesting me for me. <laughs> So let me give you, let me this give you the most really simple good. let me give you the most simple reason why okay. let me pull, we should consider let me pull my glass right airport here. privatization. Let's give me I'm gonna give you two examples. Together, now the most simple one is you own a house that you rent out, you're getting three hundred dollars a month for, and you own a hundred thousand dollar mortgage on it. Mm -hmm. You're making three hundred dollars a month, you own a hundred thousand dollar, and you own a hundred thousand dollar mortgage. I come to you and say, Bill, listen, lease me your house for thirty years. I'm gonna pay off that hundred thousand dollar mortgage. I'm going to give you another $100,000 up front. 
I'm going to rent it out, mm. and you're going to get a piece of the rent that I get off of it. Dang, Bill. <laughs> Now that's what now, now that's what that's, that's what Earthquake Property says. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pay off your hundred thousand dollars. I'm gonna give you hundred thousand dollars out front, put in your pocket, and, and I'm gonna rent it, and you are gonna get a share of the rent, and I'm gonna fix your house up. So you want the best of dime into it? When he say that, what you gonna say? Well I, well, I would say, well, what's the cost of the rent? What 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 is it, the what does the rent look it, like it, over the long term? In what this it, in this in this instance, because I paid you up front, uh -huh. hundred thousand paid off your mortgage. Okay. I'm invested and fixed what up your house. You I fixed That's up your house. I gave you, women, I gave you hundred thousand dollars up front, and you get a, a, a cut of the rent. I'm gonna set the rent at a level where I can make my money back, and at the same time give you a cut. If they don't rent it, doesn't hurt you. You got your money up front, and I'm on the line to give you some money on an every year basis. Mm -hmm. So that's what it is. I'm taking a risk. That's what venture capitalists do. That's what we do. Equity I mean, I, I we take risks. I understand. You, you, should, you should be compensated. But, but we take that risk. risk. Back. I, I, Wait a minute. We take that risk. So, so now let's get back to why privatization is important. So we got an airport that 90% of it is rented out. Uh -huh. Rented out now. The, right. the terminals are owned by the airlines. <laughs> the gates are rented by the airlines. Uh -huh. All of the spaces in there where you go buy something is leased to somebody. The sushi shine place is leased. So it's already leased out. So that's the, we're already leasing it, uh -huh. and by law, because of the way it's structured with the FAA, the amount of money that the city get, gets off the airport on an annual basis is six to twelve million, and it can't exceed that mm -hmm. because the federal do yeah because the federal dollars went in to help build the airport, oh, so we can't exceed. God. So government says government changed the law and come up with a pilot program said we'll waive that. You can make as much money as you can mm -hmm. off of this off of this under new privatization, and so. So let's give an example. Puerto Rico, they did it. They gave Puerto Rico uh, about, about $680 million up front, mm -hmm. and they're giving them money on an annual basis. What I'm saying to folks is that from what we're hearing across the industry, uh, privatization of St. Louis Airport can maybe net a billion, a billion and a half up front, and, and that's money. You can do anything you want with it. My thing is with a billion, billion dollar and a half billion dollar cash injection to the city, if I can get it, because I want to put it in a charter with North St. Louis, 50% of that money has to be invested in North St. Louis. I just talked about income, household income, dealing with issues. Mm -hmm. You give me a half billion dollars to $750 million to invest in North St. Louis, and we don't have all the strings attached that's attached to it, like, like block grant and all the other things, I fix North St. Louis. Let me ask you Your turn. How, how many uh, private commercial airports are there? around the world. Uh, you mean privatized or private airports? See, there's Pri a difference. Privatized. Because, because like, 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 well, in Europe, this has been going on for years, and so what's happening... Well, how many... In, in a, in a, now, 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 if you go back to... <laughs> yeah, if you go back, but if you go back to my, my, my op-ed, mm -hmm. I outlined every significant airport that is either fully privatized in the U.S. or partially privatized. Okay. And, and so, for instance, if you... Denver, when you go in Denver's terminal, you fly into Denver, you're in Denver term, Denver's term, terminal is privatized. It's not owned, by, it's owned by Denver, but it's leased out to a private, in, a private industry, and they're the ones who are doing repairs. Those are the ones who are putting all the stores in there, and they reap their money. But they, so when you fly into Denver, you fly into LaGuardia, terminal there. So some airports, so what happened with, and, tell, and remember the FAA, the feds just changed the law. Mm -hmm. But prior to that, the airports had, what they had to do was, do it partially privatized. They couldn't do full. And so that's how I use it. Then that's because we're talking about P3s. Mm -hmm. P3s are not new. We've been doing P3s for uh Bill Bridges, mm -hmm. light rail, to uh public private partnerships for uh, uh sewers. P3s are not new. What is new is using P3s to fully privatize uh airports. That's new because the law changed. As a matter of fact, the uh Oh, what's the railroad? Back going back to the eighteen hundreds, where they put the golden spike when the when the railroads met when the, the first cross country. Mm -hmm. I don't know. You know, I forgot what they, I was born in seventy six. <laughs> so I was born in nineteen seventy six. My point is that was privatized. Uh -huh. That was private. That was public and private. Okay. That okay. was public and private okay. that made that happen. Okay. Okay. The 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 replacement for the World Trade Center. Mm -hmm. The ground is owned by the Port Authority. Right. Mm. But the building and all that was privatized. Private industry had to do that. Had to come in, lease from the port of the port authority. So that's what it yeah, is. That's, that's it. So, now why don't you 
Yeah. Agree. Can I just yeah. ask you to kind of weigh in on your <laughs> opinion? Because your opinions be interesting. My opinions are, they always interesting. <laughs> so at, at, at interesting. Least, I, I don't know. I, I just, I think, you know, certain things, you know, not that government does everything well, um, but, you know, I think that there are certain things that are best left to government, um, you know, to perform. And I, I, I think, I, I look at that as sort of a, a regional asset uh, in the okay. same way as, as a zoo is. You still own it. I, I mean, I, I, I get what you're saying. Yeah, you still own it. I get what you're saying. But, yeah. but, but when, when you infuse a, uh, I think, a, a financial um, expectation uh, or, or a profit expectation in what, what I consider to be a regional asset, yeah. in the same way that like I, I completely disagree with private jails. I think private jails should be completely eliminated around this country. <laughs> yeah, but that's different. But but, I mean, I, but, private, different, but, 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 but let me say, but private revenue, the private revenue incentive mm. is in the airport period even though it's public. So, so I'm saying it ain't that, that's not the issue. If that's the yeah, issue. They're, they're not, they're not, I the, mean, the, 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 they're reporting they're, they're, to the public, get, they're not reporting to shareholders. Well, it depends on who the equity fund is, they may report to shareholders, but what I'm trying to get at is that the people who are leasing the airport now are leasing it to make money. The airlines are there to make money and they're driven by money. Yeah. And, and, and so, and at the same time, we spent a billion and a half dollars 20 years ago to build that W1W airport took Bridge and out, and it's the least used runway. <laughs> so the, the, the public did that. The he government did that. The government well, did no, that. He didn't get nothing. No, no, no. Oh, oh, but oh, okay. no, no. <laughs> Go, government did that. And 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 and, and, and result of that, we paying. We got eight hundred million dollars in debt. We paying off now on the airport. And so and let's be clear. No matter how much money we got off the airport, if it's outside of that program, how much money the re region doesn't get anything. They don't pay taxes. They don't pay property taxes. <laughs> they don't pay all of that because of it's publicly owned. On the private side, under the lease, they would. It, 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 is, it is not about, let's just say, it is about having a first-class airport that provides the services to the customer that they need, and if, and if they can do that and provide that service and drive revenue, and drive revenue more than this piddly, Six hundred six million dollars a year that we get paying off eight million eight hundred million dollars in debt. If you, I didn't say it was pretty. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and put the run, and put the runway to use that's been been sitting there empty for. To, it, they can, wait, we got a runway that can, we can land any any type of plane that's B made today. <laughs> we can land it on that runway. That runway gets used twenty percent of the time. I think this is the opportunity when a, a lot of people say, "Hey, uh, government needs to stay out." Uh, or <laughs> business need to stay out. This is I, I am for privatization. Okay. Uh, You're for for what you have you been, have you thought about it enough? Mm, my mom works at the airport and she is actually not for it. So I'm a she, roll, she's a city she's I'm a, a city employee. My mama. Is she a city employee? Yeah, if she work for the airport. Yeah. She's no, no. Employee. See, that's what I'm saying. Eighty percent of the people working at the airport work for those private oh, companies. Oh, for Delta and whoever. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, no, well, she works for where they used to be host. I don't really. Yeah, know hosting and that's it's private. It's private. It's private. Okay. It ain't the city. All I know is she ain't <laughs> cool, so yeah, I just yeah. got my mom been out there thirty years. Actually, we joke. My mm -hmm. mama shot your joke out real quick. We say she built the airport because she. Then I had to know your mother. Years. I worked at host. My, I worked Venus. at host when I first my came back to St. Louis. If you ask her, does she know Mildred Walton and some other folks? She was for her yeah. for But what, what I'm trying to get at is, is that, the, here's, a, here's a good example. There's 2,500 employees at the airport, and 80, 75 said that 80% of them work for the people. Yeah. Who, they, they, they're not city employees. <laughs> and, and the only way that they make money and get paid is that the traffic goes up. Yeah. If, it wasn't for South, if it wasn't for Southwest, we wouldn't have an airport. You're right about that. <laughs> if it was I was expansion, we wouldn't have an airport. We, we, we did, we wanted yeah, base, she was a uh, part of that big hubs. TWA yeah. shutdown, and, and it changed yeah. like after September 11. Like we used to could go out there and hang out with mom and do all that, but after September 11, we couldn't go out there and hang out no more. So yeah, but she, everybody she's else is doing it in, in the airports. They have to thrive, and you and, and always remember this: to the flying public, the airport really is your front door. First thing they see when they land in St. Louis. And it makes a different way. city to see. <laughs> I was in, which airport was it that I was in? Where you go, to, you know how they have the uh, the belts that, that you, right. 
it was like an escalator, but right. a flat, whatever. It was. Right. What, what do you call it? I moving, know. move, people moving, people, whatever, uh-huh. people. Moving. But I forget whether it was Atlanta or whether it was Cincinnati, where you go through and it's lit up like throughout the whole yeah. thing, like it's yeah. lit. It looks like yeah. a club. <laughs> and I, I was, like as soon as Seattle, I got off, I was like, oh. I to come up to see him. It's like, what did y'all get this up yeah, for? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, no, Train is yeah, taking yeah. you all this. We just got a couple distance. nice paintings. Yeah. That's yeah. it. It makes a difference. You're right. You're and, right. And, and, I, 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 and, and, I can't have one of them that. big, nice airports like other cities. Well, not just that, but we, we talking about the, the cargo. We talking about we don't have a, a hotel. We don't have a hotel on airport property. True. You can't rent a car on airport property. But we own 1,500 acres around the airport that's vacant. Yeah. Private enterprise, what they're going to do is find a way to build a hotel on site because it brings in revenue to help pay that money back. They're going to, the, the rental car companies want a, want a facility on site. Right. They don't want it. When you get on the airport, they got the shuttle. Matter of fact, now when you get a rental car, sometimes you have to go all the way to St. <laughs> Anne. <laughs> 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 I'm 